Today, we are very happy to have Professor Jennifer Pan from Stanford University to be here and share with us her recent research about weather and how information flows um, across national borders, especially across the borders of the regimes with strict censorship, such as China. Um, Jennifer, so first of all, let me briefly um, introduce Jennifer to all of you. Um, Jennifer is a um, professor of communication and a senior fellow at the Friedman Spotley Institute at Stanford University. I got to know Jennifer back in 2016, I think, when I was a graduate student at Stanford, and Jennifer just joined Stanford as an assistant professor. At that time, she was already a widely known rising star in computational social science, specialized in communication and political science topics. I audited her course on big data and causal inference, and not, not like exaggerating, her classroom was always full of people. Now, after only about six years, um, I'm very happy to learn that Jennifer has already become a full professor of communication at Stanford University, which is undoubtedly a record set achievement. Um, substantively, Jennifer's research focuses on political communication and authoritarian politics. She uses experimental and computational methods, um, the state of art techniques, with large scale data sets on political activity in China and other authoritarian regimes to answer questions about how autocrats perpetuate their rule. Um, her work has appeared in top science, political science journals, such as um, Amer American Political Science Review, American Journal of Political Science, Comparative Political Studies, et cetera, as well as top general sciences journals, such as Science. I personally often cited her work in both my research and my teaching. So thank you very much, Jennifer, for offering such great research. Today, Jennifer's talk will be about how information flows from the world to China by developing a semi-automated system that combines deep learning and human annotation um, to find co-occurring content across different social media platforms and languages. Um, Jennifer evaluates the volume and mechanisms that information flows from the global information ecosystem into China. Okay, so now without further ado, I will now turn the table to Jennifer. Let's welcome. Hi everyone. Thanks so much for having me. Um, and thanks for the very kind introduction. The work that I am going to talk about today is a joint project with collaborators at Stanford and formerly UCLA, although some folks have gone on to other universities. So the motivation for this project is digital communication technologies, internet, social media, which have really changed the way that information can flow across borders and national boundaries. But we also know that information doesn't flow freely everywhere. Governments all over the world have imposed restrictions on access to digital information. So for many countries, there are regulatory controls, such as um, uh, laws that have been passed, as well as technical uh, strategies, such as internet filtering or shutdowns. And so if we just look in the last few years, in 2020, there were 155 internet shutdowns around the world. And uh, countries from Russia to Iran to Cambodia to Uganda have implemented countrywide firewalls to filter information and control the transnational flow of information. But probably, uh, actually very likely, the most sophisticated and extensive sustained measure to control the transnational flow of information has occurred in China and continues to occur. Many internet sites and online services are not accessible when you're in mainland China. But importantly, China is not disconnected from the global information ecosystem. So the question that we set out to answer in this paper is how much information flows into China from this global system, and how does this inflow occur? Is it mediated by the Chinese government and state media, or does social media play some role in facilitating this inflow of information? So what we want to do is try to capture what information captures that captures global public attention makes its way into public discussions in China. And so our proxy for global uh, 
topics of conversation is viral Twitter discussions. So this is an imperfect proxy for many reasons, but this is what we're using in this paper as a proxy for capturing global public attention. And we focus on events, actions, ideas, and opinions that originate outside of China's borders. So I just wanna be clear, we're including events, actions that are occurring, ideas, as well as opinions. And then we consider such a discussion as making its way into public discussions in China if it makes its way into uh, Weibo. So again, that's a proxy for public discussion in China, but again, it's an imperfect one. So it's capturing online, one type of online public discussion. So we focus on Twitter and Weibo because they're both very public forms of social media where for the most part, if you make a post, it's not limited to your direct connections or like friends or followers, as in the case of sites like Facebook or WeChat, where it's more um, restrictions on who sees content. And so Twitter or Weibo are more likely places where information is shared and where it, users go to seek information when there is a high level of uncertainty that's occurring. So when you're information seeking. Uh, so example here in California would be if I feel my house shaking, I'm going to go to Twitter. I'm not going to go to Facebook or YouTube or Reddit. I'm going to go to Twitter to see if anyone else is saying that their house is shaking. So is there an earthquake happening here? So when there's this uncertainty and when you're seeking timely pertinent information, the viral content on uh, Twitter and Weibo transcends, is most likely to transcend local uh, neighborhoods and smaller communities. So at the time that we collected this data, Twitter had about 200 million daily active users, 80% of whom were outside the US. So we, I don't know for folks on this webinar, but at least for many uh, who study social media in the US, we tend to think of uh, Twitter as US focused, but users of Twitter are predominantly global. And then uh, in contrast, Weibo has about 250 million daily active users, and they're almost entirely within uh, the PRC. So the data for this paper comes from January to April 2020. So this is when COVID was first spreading around the world. And so we think of it as a time when there's heightened global attention on China. And it's the type of time when global information may be most likely to flow into China because those in China want to see how what's happening in the rest of the world, uh, as well as how the world is seeing China. And so when you see the results that I'm going to present, I want you to think of it as likely a ceiling for inflows of information rather than an average. Okay, so as COVID-19 emerged, a number of researchers collected social media data pertaining to the pandemic and made these data sets uh, publicly available. Uh, for this paper, we're using these existing public social media data sets, so I just want to be very clear and transparent. We did not gather this data. We're using data uh, that others have gathered. And um, for Twitter specifically, we're using Ch Chen et al.'s repository of tweet IDs related to COVID-19. From this repository, we identified 14 million posts made between January 21st and April 30th, 2020. Uh, then uh, in March of 2021, so a year later, we used these tweet IDs to of these 14 million posts to retrieve the full content of the tweets as well as the tweet metadata. Okay, so Chen et al. Uh, collected this data, but didn't want to violate Twitter's terms of service. So this repository is just tweet IDs. Okay. Then we filtered these 14 million tweet, uh, uh, tweets uh, to 1.8 million. That's tagged as English language and containing uh, keywords related to China. Um, and so we're constraining to content related to China, again, this is why the estimates that I'm going to give you are more likely to be a ceiling rather than the average. Uh, and also we're focusing on the most viral tweets, which are most likely to reach a larger audience globally and possibly more likely to spread to China. 
So to get the viral tweets, we stratified our sample of 1.8 million by week and extracted just the 10 most retweeted tweets by week related to COVID and to China. So the whole data set is related to COVID. We filtered based on China. And then for each week, we're extracting the top 10 most retweeted tweets. Uh, we also filter out content that is very general. So uh, there's a viral tweet that's just expressing sympathy for China, saying COVID-19 in China is terrible. We exclude that because what we're trying to do is find co-occurring content on Weibo and something really general might have matches that are false positives. Okay. Uh, well, so what you see here in this figure is the distribution of retweets. The y-axis is a log scale. So just keep that in mind. Uh, and that's the number of retweets. And the on the left, you see this distribution for the entire sample of 1.8 million tweets pertaining to COVID-19 in China. And then on the right, you see the distribution of log retweets for just our sample. And as you can see, the mean retweet of tweets in the sample of 150 tweets is order of magnitude higher than the mean retweet of the all China-related tweets. But I just want to note that in the set of 1.8 million, you do see some tweets that have a higher retweet count than tweets in our sample. And that's because there were some very highly retweeted tweets that didn't satisfy our sampling criteria. And also because the volume of discussion of COVID-19 during this uh, four month period varied by week. So in one week you could have the 20th most retweeted tweet, uh, but, and that's actually has more retweeted tweets than the second most retweeted tweet in another week. All right. But for the most part, we are getting tweets across this time period that are highly uh, retweeted. So for Weibo, we then use the publicly available Weibo Cove data set. And uh, this is the basis on which we search for viral Twitter content. This Weibo Cove data set was collected retrospectively by Hu et al. Uh, in 2020, April of 2020. And all posts, uh, it, it, it contains, so how do they create the sample? They identified active users on Weibo, about 20 million of them. And then they collected posts from these users. And then these posts were then filtered using uh, nearly 200 COVID related keywords. So there are a couple of different Weibo COVID data sets and we're using this one, the Weibo Cove data set because it is based on a relatively more diverse set and sample of Weibo users. So this data set uh, is keyword based and it's based on a large number of keywords, almost 200, as I mentioned. And so we, what we do is actually train a deep learning classifier on top of this to filter out posts that contain COVID-19 related keywords, but don't focus on COVID. So for example, we had posts that were talking about outbreak, but they were talking about previous disease outbreaks. So more specifically, we um, fine-tuned a pre-trained Chinese BERT with whole word uh, masking model on a sample about 5,500 human annotated um, Weibo posts. And so the final data set, final Weibo data, data set contains 6.7 million COVID-related posts made between the dates in January and April of 2020. Okay, so that's our data. And our goal is to determine whether English viral tweets co-occur in Chinese on Weibo. So that's the first, that's the task for the kind of computational side of things. And this is challenging for a couple of different reasons. One, this is a multilingual task that is a cross-platform matching problem where the source and target texts are written in uh, different formats, not to mention the different languages. So the source is English Twitter, which has a maximum character limit of 140 characters, whereas the target is Weibo Chinese, doesn't have these character limitations. And of course, there are different authors coming from a different uh, social, political, cultural context who are writing. Um, second, this is challenging because there's a really large number of candidate pairs that have to be evaluated for matching. So let's assume there's a, n tweets and m Weibo posts, then n times m pairs 
n times m pairs need to be compared and evaluated. So even if we limited, we limited the n to 150, and let's say we limited uh, the m to one a day, this is still then a very intensive uh, computational task and something that's too large for human annotation. Okay, but then because the social media text, at least on Twitter, is on average very short, but yet can contain a lot of nuance, a fully automated method will have difficulty achieving high levels of performance in determining whether these two social media posts talk about the same thing. Okay, so what we do is divide this task into retrieval, ranking, and human annotation. And we use deep learning based neural um, natural language processing and information retrieval methods to do the retrieval and ranking part. And then we are using human verification and annotation to make the final matches. All right, so I'm going to go through each of these steps in uh, more detail. So starting, okay, with retrieval. The goal of the retrieval step is just to reduce the number of target Weibo posts. So for a tweet, we consider Weibo posts made within a plus or minus five day period. So that is some a threshold that we are um, using. We tested the uh, we tested different thresholds, and plus or minus five days allowed us to have good recall without sacrificing too much um, in terms of precision. So we have this plus or minus five day period uh, based on the time span of the tweet. Um, if so, uh, just to give you an example of what can go wrong if we didn't have this narrower time window, it means that sometimes you see content that looks similar occurring, but maybe two weeks apart or even a month apart. But it's not that one content is transmitting to the other. It's just that the same issue is coming up again. And you definitely see that happening, especially around COVID as COVID is spreading. Something that happens in one country that you see in another country later on. Okay. Um, so we then translate for this first retrieval step we translate the English language tweets to Chinese using the Google Translate API. We also did some tests using native Chinese speakers to do the translation and we didn't find a difference. Uh, so we're using Google Translate, though it has some known flaws for this first step. And we're creating a vector for the translated, so then we have the translated uh, Chinese translated tweet. We then create a vector for that, uh, for that tweet by averaging the word vectors of the word uh, word vectors of the words in that tweet, we're using word to vec embedding trained on a corpus of twenty million Weibo posts that um, I worked on for a previous paper. So then, for each source tweet, we're retrieving the top ten thousand Weibo posts with the highest cosine similarity measured over that embedding. So this is super straightforward. Uh, we're translating creating this uh, vector using word to vec embedding and then doing the cosine similarity of the embeddings and taking the ten, top 10,000 most similar based on that. So this is just to narrow the pool. In the next step, in the ranking step, we're trying to identify for every tweet, the most similar K Weibo posts among that 10,000 candidates that we got from the retrieval step. So it, it, this is because it's still very impractical for human annotators to verify 10,000 Weibo posts for every tweet. So this ranking step reduces the cost of human labor. Uh, but here we are using uh, a universal sentence encoder for the ranking. So the universal sentence encoder has a number of advantages over word to vec uh, but we use it for this ranking step rather than retrieval because it has a much higher computational cost. So it took, it took although we actually eventually we did rerun everything <laughs> on the retrieval step with use, and but then for the methods for the paper, we stuck with the word to vec because it took word to vec two hours to match the 150 tweets, so 1 million Weibo posts, and uh, use, it took 135 hours. So that's a big um, increase in computational cost. Uh, I mean, maybe computational costs will come down in the future, but for us, we felt that uh, using word to vec to narrow um, the pool of candidates and using this universal sentence encoder to 
uh, rank was more efficient. So I know that some of you here are familiar with universal sentence encoding, but just as a review, uh, universal sentence encoding is a deep neural network that takes the sentence as an input and returns a fixed dimensional sentence vector as an output. So uh, word to vec, you're converting words to vectors. Uh, but what uh, universal sentence encoder aims to do is try to capture the context that the word is uh, for the sentence that it's in. So it's a sentence level encoding. And uh, how you, universal uh, sentence encoder does this is splitting the sentence into units called subwords. So they're actually more granular than words. Uh, so for an English example, the word concentrate could be split up into con and center and eight. So concentrate would be split up into three subwords. And then their semantic representation is obtained separately and then aggregated for that word. Uh, so word to vec is based on a two-layer neural network, uh, and while the universal sentence encoder is based on a convolutional neural network. So uh, for an example, in Chinese, the Chinese word uh, would have the same embedding always uh, for word to vec, you know, based on a, some training. But with universal sentence encoder, it would be, trumbo would be translated or interpreted as propagate if we're talking about trumbo uh, bingdu, but it would be understood differently if we're talking about Xin Xi Chuan So the, the, so the embeddings would be different for Chuan in those two cases. Uh, so we like universal sentence encoder because it can capture this context space semantic distinction. And that's why we, there's some people refer to this as a contextualized embedding in contrast to a static embedding like word to vec. All right, so then practically speaking, how do we implement this? We are employing a multilingual version of universal sentence encoder that was available on TensorFlow. Um, and so just to note, there's no translation here. So for the retrieval step, we translated it. But here we're taking the English and using this multilingual version of the universal sentence encoder uh, to find the Chinese matches. And this model that we're using was translate, trained by Google on a um, 60 million scale web corpora. So, okay, so then we can rank the 10,000 candidates in terms of the sentence level similarity. So then a really important analytical decision that we have to make is to select the proper K. So that's the number of Weibo posts we'll send to our human annotators. So if K is too small, then there could be Weibo posts that co-occur, but we're missed. But if K is too large, then it's going to be very costly and time consuming for human annotators to uh, review. So we selected K based on an initial investigation of how the K influences detection of co-occurring Weibo posts. In this figure, you can see the total number of Weibo posts match the tweets. So that's on the y-axis uh, as a function of K, which is increasing on the x-axis. You can see that there's a rapid increase in the number of tweets with detected co-occurring Weibo posts when K increases to 40, and this rate slows down afterwards and is largely stable after K equals 60. But we wanted to, since we were trying this for the first time, to err on the side of conservatism and to maximize our chances of detecting co-occurrence, we set K to equal 100. Uh, and the last step in our approach is to employ bilingual Chinese and English speakers to evaluate the, this top ranked 100 Weibo posts that are produced in the ranking step. Um, so these bilingual annotators were provided with the Weibo posts in Chinese and the original English tweet with all the relevant links and metadata. And so for each Weibo tweet pairing, we have two research assistants who read the content and they annotated the posts as matching. If um, the tweet, if the Weibo post, post covered the same issue as the tweet, and, but we don't care about sentiment, so the sentiment could be different. Okay. All right, so that's all about co-occurrence, but we wanted to go even a step further to try to determine whether co-occurrence constitutes the inflow of information. And to do that, we conducted really in-depth investigations of each co-occurring match. So 
I should just say that there are lots of actually different computational methods we could have used to determine co-occurrence. But what we realized in this process is that if we wanted to know the direction of information flow, we needed this detailed information, a uh, detailed investigation. And I'll show you some examples that will reveal why. So inflow we define as occurring if events, actions, ideas, or opinions discussed in a viral tweet originated outside of China. So what this excludes are actions of the Chinese government, as well as events or ideas that are originating in China. So let's suppose there's a new pol government policy and Weibo users are discussing it. That's not inflow, even if that discussion makes its way and becomes viral on Twitter. But let's say the same policy results in opinion outside of China that is not seen on Weibo, but then is picked up on Weibo later on, we consider that to be information inflow. So information inflow occurs if the Weibo post is uh, echoing that event action idea or opinion or responding to it, questioning it, questioning it, uh, critiquing it. So this is based on issue, not on agreement or similarity of sentiment. It's also not sufficient for a tweet and a Weibo to post to be talking about the same general topic. So if a tweet and a Weibo post are both about electric vehicles, but they don't make the same point, then we're not going to um, include it unless they explicitly reference each other. We examine the text, metadata, and associated images and links of the tweet and Weibo post, and we also search for content related contained in the tweet and Weibo post on Chinese and English language media sites. We did Baidu and Google searches in both languages. So the investigation is not limited to what is seen on the two social media platforms, but much broader. All right, so turning to the results. This figure visualizes 150 viral posts up uh, tweets by date. Okay, you're not meant to be able to read the words here. It's just to give you a sense of uh, the retweet count. So that's the y-axis. Again, it's on a logarithmic scale. And what we see is that 68 out of the 150 viral tweets co-occur on Weibo. So this is highlighted in green. And so these are viral tweets about COVID in China in the first quarter of 2020 when COVID was just spreading globally. And so these co-occurrences actually occur throughout this time period. But of the 68, only 32, which are highlighted in blue, represent inflows of information. And so the remaining is content that is flowing actually from China outside. So there are many things that are happening in China that gets picked up on global social media and goes viral on Twitter. So about 24 to 28% of information that's not originating in China, I should also say that, sorry, of the remaining that's not inflow, there's some, some are ambiguous and we just could not determine where the information originated. So then it leads us to this, some uncertainty around a quarter of information not originating in China that captures global public attention makes its way into China. So when we look at what types of information flow in, we find it's not misinformation. So that's a good thing. About 4% of the 150 viral tweets contain misinformation and 6% of the inflow contains uh, misinformation. So a similar amount of misinformation makes its way into China as is circulating globally. What is more disproportionate uh, is that antagonism directed at China is more likely to flow into the country. Overall, in the 150 viral tweets, 37% contain antagonism toward China. That could be toward the Chinese government, toward the Chinese people, toward the Chinese Communist Party. But among content that flows into China, 66% is antagonistic. So what that means is in the first quarter of 2020, the majority of viral tweets related to COVID in China reported either facts or expressed support for what was going on in China and what was China, what China, Chinese people were going through. So some did contain antagonistic comments toward China, criticizing the Chinese government, some were racist, but this type of antagonism disproportionately went into China. So if you're outside of China in the first quarter of 2020, you would have seen some antagonism toward China, but more just reporting and sympathetic content. But if you're inside of China, what you saw of global conversations involving COVID in China was primarily antagonistic. All right, so then I'm gonna talk about how did information flow into the country? 
And I want to talk about four, we identified four mechanisms of information inflow transmission. The first is through Chinese state media or the Chinese government. And we operationalize state media as outlets that are directly controlled by a Chinese, uh, by a Communist Party propaganda department or other uh, Communist Party organization, as well as a government agency or bureau. Okay. The second me mechanism is through commercialized media. So these are outlets not directly controlled by the Communist Party propaganda department, other CCP organization, or a government agency or bureau. The third mechanism is Weibo users who are not affiliated with any traditional media outlet or the government. And the last mechanism is direct dissemination of information in China by a foreign entity. Uh, so I'm going to go through each of these and give you some examples, and you'll see the complexity of uh, inflows. Okay, some of you may remember in February of 2020, the Wall Street Journal published an opinion piece that was titled, China is the real sick man of Asia. There was a kind of really intense response to this in the US as well as in China. Then about two weeks later on February 19th, uh, Chinese state media outlets like CGTN, People's Daily reported that China had expelled three Wall Street Journal reporters from China. Then less than four hours later, then U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo retweeted that the he said, the United States condemns the move by China to expel the Wall Street uh, Journal reporters. Mature, responsible countries understand that a free press reports facts and especially opinions. China should not restrict hashtag free speech. Okay, so he tweeted this four hours after the news broke. The This condemnation of China, Pompeo's condemnation of China, is one of the 150 viral tweets in our sample, and it's picked up by a variety of uh, foreign news outlets. So just to note here, China's expulsion of the journalists is not inflow of information, but Pompeo's criticism of China's actions occurred outside of China. It went viral on Twitter, and that's what's constituting the inflow. So it's Pompeo's opinion reaction. Okay, but in any case, four days later on February 23rd, uh, Beijing Zhou Bao, a state media outlet, transmits information about Pompeo's criticism of China's expulsion of the Wall Street journalists to a domestic audience by posting a video on Weibo criticizing the Wall Street Journal and responding to Pompeo's comments. So here, it's the uh, a state media outlet that is telling Chinese people what Pompeo said and bringing that information into the country. We also see examples of government agencies, particularly embassies, facilitating the inflow of information. So in one case, in late March of 2020, Spanish media outlets reported that Chinese-made testing kits were defective. The Chinese embassy in Spain refuted this allegation on Twitter, um, as well as on Chinese social media. And so then that brought the information into China, Chinese media outlets reported on it. Okay, then you have another case in mid-April, a German media outlet criticizes just China's general COVID response. This gets attention on Twitter. This prompts a response from uh, the Chinese embassy in Germany. And the Chinese embassy in Germany posts a response on Twitter in German and in Chinese and posts that same response on the China's Ministry of Foreign Affairs website, which is accessible into China. So the embassy's response is uh, how the information gets transmitted into the country. In total, we have 10 instances where information inflow is facilitated by either state media or a Chinese government entity. Okay, so then there are some instances of information inflow that's facilitated by commercialized media. Uh, Wang Yi, Net NetEase News, was the first Chinese media outlet to report that WHO had convened a meeting to declare COVID a global emergency. And that immediately gained a ton of attention on Weibo. And actually, this news gained attention on Weibo before Twitter, likely because of the time zone difference. But still, this is an inflow of information because WHO is meeting outside of China, and this information is making its way into China. Uh, here's another example of information inflow facilitated by commercialized Chinese media. Uh, Pompeo appears again on April 22nd of 2020. Pompeo is criticizing the Chinese government in a press conference. 
uh, for delaying some sort of COVID report to the WHO. Later that day, uh, Guantan Zhou Wang, which is commercialized media according to our definition, criticizes Pompeo for his remarks uh, on its online forum, as well as its Weibo and Weixin accounts. An hour later, uh, Guan Cha's Weibo post is copied by other Weibo accounts. Okay, and then and then it's actually not till the next day on April 23rd that Pompeo tweets a video clip of the press conference and that gains attention on Twitter. So that shows why we need that plus or minus time window. Um, all right, so in total, we have seven instances where commercialized media is facilitating information inflow. We then find a number of cases where Weibo users who are not affiliated with uh, traditional media outlets or the Chinese government facilitates information inflow. I, I should say that we could not detect any affiliation on part of these users. I mean, it's possible that they did, but we couldn't tell by looking at their accounts uh, or trying to look up information about them. All right, so... Uh, Sometimes content flowed directly from Twitter to Weibo. So on February 2020, someone tweeted, Cor uh, coronavirus is like pasta, the Chinese invented it, the Italians spread it all over the world. And this went viral on Twitter. A few hours uh, later, after the post was made, a Twitter user that is geolocated to Brazil uh, posted the tweet to Weibo. So this Twitter user also has a Weibo account, is living outside of China, posted from Twitter to Weibo. Uh, we find no evidence that any traditional Chinese media outlets re reported this, and so it suggests that Weibo users who are living outside of China play a role in this information transmission. We also find uh, Weibo users sourcing information from directly from foreign media outlets, and in our time period, we see them citing reports from BuzzFeed, Fox News, New York Times, PBS, uh, and reposting that content onto Weibo. But often, okay, that, that's direct transmission, but often we see much more convoluted paths of transmission that involve a lot of different media outlets interplay between traditional and social media. So here you have an editor of an Indian media platform posting a video from an Urdu television channel. So first it was an Urdu television channel. Some Indian uh, media platform editor sees that video, reposts that video onto Twitter saying that Chinese masks sent to Pakistan were made uh, from underwear. Two days later, you have the Business Standard, English language Indian daily newspaper that publishes a story on this topic. Okay, so now so you have traditional media into English in Urdu into English language Twitter, now back into English language uh, traditional media in India. But then later that day, New, New Tang Dynasty Television, which is a U.S.-based media outlet that's founded by Falun Gong adherents, that's highly critical of the CCP and blocked in China, they then picked up the story from the Business Standard in India and cited both the tweet and the Business Standard article. Then you have two hours later, a just a regular Weibo user copying the text from the New Tang Dynasty Television article, citing the Business Standard and posts, posts that on Weibo by saying that it's fake news. Okay, so in this case, you have a Weibo user that's not affiliated as far as we can tell with any media outlet or the government facil facilitating information transmission into China, but this story also involves overseas Chinese media, media professionals on Twitter, media outlets, traditional media outlets in Pakistan and India. So I, I just say this is not the only example that is convoluted like this, but I think it's really interesting that you see um, this interplay between traditional media, social media, between countries um, in the information inflow process. In total, we find 12 instances of information inflow facilitated by ordinary Weibo users. And finally, you find three instances where information flows into China because foreign entities uh, are posting directly on Weibo. So the first in February is the Russian embassy. Uh, it has a Weibo and WeChat account. It posted to both of those accounts that Russia was banning travel from China. The second one in April, MIT Technology Review posted to its Weibo account that uh, cybersecurity firms had identified like hacking and fraud related to COVID. And then the third, uh, in later in April, you have an Australian TV channel, SBS, that's posting to its Weibo account that Australia was calling for investigations into the origins of COVID-19. 
Okay. So to sum up, I'm I'm gonna I'm 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 gonna stop, but to sum up, what we find first is that the inflow of global information into China is relatively limited. So around a quarter of global uh, viral tweets make its way into China. And as I said, we, th we should think of this as a ceiling rather than the average, because we're focusing on a topic that was incredibly salient at a time, and we're looking at the most retweeted tweets. Okay, so then turning to content, while it's uh, not um, the case that misinformation disproportionately makes its way into China. It is the case that content antagonistic toward China in various forms are most likely, more likely to flow into China. Uh, then finally, uh, state media outlets and commercialized media are very important mechanisms for information inflow, but they're not the only ones. Weibo users without these media or government affiliations also bring information from international from the international media ecosystem into China, um, as well as you have foreign entities posting directly in China. So substantively, we think these results uh, further our understanding of the global online information ecosystem and how information flows into China, but also around the world. And methodologically, we hope that this paper can provide a framework for cross-lingual and or cross-platform studies of digital communication that can be applied to other contexts. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jennifer, for offering this great talk. And thank you, everyone, for participating in this webinar. And thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.